Uh, welcome, welcome to uh, uh, the UCCA Upper Captiva Civic Association Town Hall with the Lee County Sheriff's Office with uh, our team that covers our island, um, Lieutenant uh, Sawicki and Deputy Lusk and Deputy Zumbrun, uh, who are all on with us tonight. Uh, I'm really going to let uh, Lieutenant Sawicki really lead the way on, on this town hall and do most of the talking. Um, I've sent him some items to discuss uh, and, and to go through tonight. We'll kind of go through those things together. We're not going to dwell a lot on uh, some of the, the topics that we covered two years ago on, on the town hall. Things like golf carts, we'll go through them briefly, but we don't want that to be 30 minutes of, of the town hall um, as all that information is available in the video from two years ago. And there's kind of nothing we can do about it. Um, so we'll go through a bunch of topics uh, along the way. If you have a question, if you're able to raise your hand in the Zoom or, or say in the chat that you want to speak, um, or, or if you're on a phone and you, and you can't figure that out, just, just unmute and, and ask your question. Um, we want everyone to have plenty of time to ask questions. Um, during the town hall. And if, if we don't cover a topic that um, is important to you, then let's definitely bring it up along the way. But Mike, I'll let you kind of start and kind of introduce the team and, and what do you guys do for us over on North Captiva? <laughs> well, as uh, I think everybody there knows, we're the uh, uh, primary responders for Upper Captiva, uh, but we are not the only sheriff's office representatives that uh, patrol or frequent uh, upper Captiva. Um, obviously, if calls are dispatched, um, you guys are within what we would call uh, zone Gulf 2, uh, which is pretty much everything between uh, Captiva, like, you know, Redfish Bass, up to Boca Grande. Uh, so Chris, Christine, and I are responsible for zones G3, Sanibel and Captiva, and G2, which is all the Middle Islands. Um, you guys are our most populous island other than Captiva um, that, that we have a primary response component for. Uh, obviously, even though Sanibel is within our area, they also have their own police department. So uh, primarily we leave uh, routine patrol to them uh, at that location. So um, in addition to our presence there, uh, we also have members of our Marine unit that will go up there to patrol Upper Captiva. And we have a similar component to the resident deputies that are in attendance tonight uh, that are based off of Boca Grande. Um, they also will patrol North Captiva and um, they sometimes pick up response duties from us if you know we are short staffed or have uh, a, you know our boat is in for maintenance or something like that. Um, in addition to that, um, really the all of the resources of the sheriff's office are at the disposal of the people of Upper Captiva. Uh, we're a 1,700 member agency and uh, we have a, a large Marine unit and we also have an aviation unit, which we've used to bring resources to North Captiva before uh, in emergencies. And also when we have support staff that needs to come out, uh, for example, uh, you know, if we have to have detectives or uh, some other, you know, response that needs to be made out to the island, sometimes that's the most practical method for them to get out there. Um, I think most of you know me, um, Mike Sawicki. Uh, I'll give you a quick intro. Uh, I am originally from the Washington DC metropolitan area in Northern Virginia. I attended and eventually even graduated from Virginia Tech. Uh, I was a uh, deputy with the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office and Blacksburg Police Department before coming here to Lee County. Uh, I've served as a department recruiter, an academy instructor, a SWAT officer, bike patrol officer, uh, field force team leader, um, all kinds of things uh, over the years. Um, similarly, uh, you know, Christine comes to us. Christine Zumbrum was a police officer in Hanover, Pennsylvania for about 10 years before coming down here to Lee County, where she worked in the uh, in the schools, um, did some patrol out there in our uh, East District, and also has been with us now on the island since uh, 
pretty well before the hurricane. So she got a little trial by fire with coming out to the islands. Um, Deputy Chris Lusk has experience as canine officer, has been a detective, um, and has been with us out on the islands for, I think, eight years. Chris, does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. I, I have no sense of time or space, apparently. So uh, <laughs> we'll call it eight years and leave it at that. Um, so I think that covers kind of the, the basic intro for, for us. Um, so we'll just jump in with some of the things off of your list, if that's okay, Swain. Sure. Sounds great. Okay, so uh, I know we we don't want to belabor the golf cart thing. Um, we did that quite extensively in the previous town hall. Uh, also, many of you have been cornered in various parts of the island and subjected to my lengthy diatribe about golf carts and what we might be able to do to help with that. So I'll just give a quick statement about the golf carts, which is that um, the operation of golf carts on North Captiva is not regulated by county ordinance or by state statute. Uh, so we really can't do anything about, you know, the kids driving golf carts or anything as far as, you know, doing traffic stops or enforcing any kind of rule up there on the island. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about in one of the previous meetings, and I'm just going to go off on a, a quick tangent here. Um, I, I don't want to make this sound like eighth grade civics, but just so people kind of understand something about our role and authority, um, Every charging document that we do, whether it's a, a speeding ticket or a summons or a physical arrest, there's a blank on every charging document that has a place for a statute number or an ordinance number. OK, so for us to take action, official law enforcement action on something like that, it would have to be in violation of a law or ordinance. Um, I think, you know, some of you have heard me say before that you know, rogue cops playing by their own rules are awesome in movies, but they're really pretty terrible in real life. So we tend to stick with, uh, you know, things that are within law, within policy, and within the constitutional protections of uh, citizens of Lee County and, and, and visitors and uh, everybody uh, that, are, that comes through our area. Um, so that being said, we can't just, you know, decide, hey, we don't like uh, 10 year olds driving golf carts. So we're going to stop all the 10 year olds uh, under color and authority of law, drag them off of there and, and take action. That's not really something we can do. Uh, we're limited to what they would call a consensual encounter. We can't stop or detain people that aren't violating the law or that we don't have a well founded suspicion of having broken the law. Um, so we are kind of limited in what we can do with the golf carts. The one thing I will say about the golf carts is um, every golf cart up there on that island belongs to either one of you as residents or two businesses up there. So every golf cart has somebody that's accountable for it. I, I have not yet seen any visitors to the island coming across on the island girl toting a golf cart. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a theme that you're going to hear a little bit. And I know it's probably not going to be what everybody wants to hear. Um, but there are a lot of things that are going to have to have an island-based, a community-based solution brought about. And unfortunately, that's a little bit more hard work than us going out there and waving the magic law enforcement wand. Uh, but there are things we can do to mitigate a lot of the problems and a lot of the issues that we're going to discuss here tonight. Um, we really just need to get some community efficacy on these things and have you guys lead the way in these solutions. Um, so anyway, I, I know there's probably a bunch of questions about golf carts, um, but I, I think maybe those people can review those and uh, review the previous discussions we've had. And if they have any additional questions about them, please feel free to contact me either by phone or by email, and I'd be happy to respond more specifically to concerns about golf carts. Um, the, the other Golf cart adjacent issue here is golf carts on the beach uh, that was brought up. Uh, I know that's a complaint that I've heard some people mention. Um, it's not something that we have regularly encountered in our patrols up there, other than the uh, cart used by the licensed turtle monitor, which is lawful for them to be out there on the beach. It's part of their um, one of the exemptions in the county ordinance for operation of, of uh, motorized equipment on the beach is for bona fide scientific study. Um, and since they are a the licensed turtle monitor for up there, 
uh, they have training and they're conducting these scientific studies. So uh, they do have the authorization to be there. Um, the other half of that question is how do we catch people that are driving on the beach? Um, call us if you see it. But I would say, like most of the issues that are in here, uh, mitigating the problem on the front end is going to be far more effective than chasing it down on the law enforcement end. Uh, signage, letting people know that carts are not allowed on the beach. Um, and uh, one of the things that is commonly used here on Captiva with the rental companies, and you guys could certainly order a giant batch of them if you can agree on the language for it, is that they put decals on the inside windshield of the golf carts and it explains the rules, uh, laws and, you know, common operational uh, uh, expectations, tips, et cetera, right there uh, on that. And in fact, the, the Captiva golf cart ordinance is going to require renters uh, of golf carts to put to place those in every golf cart uh, offered for rent. Uh, now, I know, as we've discussed a lot about the nature of Upper Captiva, and the fact that there is no publicly maintained roadways, um, it would be more of a, a best practices guideline for you guys up there and for your uh, tenants and, and people who rent golf carts and things to attach something in there. And it, it may, on discussion with your attorney, it might help to mitigate some of your own risk of people operating those carts of saying, hey, they can't claim they weren't advised. I mean, it's literally right in front of them uh, every time they sit behind the steering wheel of that cart. So that's one thing that we can do to help some of the golf cart issues. Um, anything on that before I move forward? Yeah, so just to, just to kind of weigh in there, uh, UCC does have uh, a couple of uh, projects we're working on right now to try to block. Uh, there, there are really six main access points where people can get carts onto the beach. And we're we're working through a program to block it. We're, we're hoping to get a, new fire chief to kind of work on that with so we don't you know do anything that that um, hampers their access but right. we've got that and we've got a a signage uh project that we're working on to kind of put up some of these this mess yeah, and, and you guys do have uh already you know obviously going into the state park property there's a uh a locked gate so you know some of the options that we've used here on captiva to good effect have been um uh a either pull out signs um, that's one that's very commonly used in our beach accesses uh, has signs on there no motorized vehicles a couple of other advisory signs about lightning and stingrays and what have you but if we need to get through there we can just you know yoke that sign right out of the ground and go go past right. and 99.9 percent .9 of the park users uh, don't start grabbing on and moving that sign to figure out right. if they can they lift it out of place um, but if there's a concern about people just bypassing that, um, they do make knockdowns that have locks so where you need to unlock the bollard before you pull it out uh, or a chain or, or something like that would work pretty well. But I think uh, like with a lot of these issues, if you make it so you keep the honest people honest, it will probably mitigate that problem down to uh, a level that's much more within your community standard and something that's more acceptable to, to all of you as residents. Any, uh, anyone else have any questions about uh, golf carts before we move on? And we and, uh, just FYI, why, because there's a question about it. We are going to move uh, into internal combustion engines next. Perfect. Anything on golf carts? Nope. All right. Okay. Uh, well, then we'll move right on to the internal combustion engines. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think uh, you probably have, I don't know if you still have that letter that you'd received from planning. I think that explains it about as well as as can be done. Yeah. Um, but the the short version of what it says in there is that uh, it, the county is not authorized to regulate that under the state statutes. Um, and so the current ordinance that talks about the internal combustion engines up there is part of your comprehensive plan, which does not have an enforcement mechanism. It's more of a, a, a statement of community right. expectation and things. But uh, uh, unfortunately, that is one of the, the gas carts is one of the issues that uh, you guys will probably have to work on as a community. And, you know, whenever I mention that you guys are going to have to work on that as a community, we're not trying to duck out of the problem. It just means that there's not a 
ready law enforcement solution for it, but we're more than happy to provide uh, you know, advice uh, on points of law, on things that have worked in other areas. I mean, obviously, we cover several different islands, and so we have different, so, you know, they've come up with different solutions on different islands to some of these problems. So we're happy to help you model solutions, even if there's not a uh, an enforcement mechanism in there for us. Right. And and uh, to recap for everyone, just the, the letter, I reached out to the county to get uh, clarification on this. And the, the short backstory is, you know, over a decade ago, the county helped put together these community panels uh, in um, unincorporated Lee County. And, and most areas had a North Captiva. We had an, an upper Captiva community panel um, that uh, came together and actually created our Dark Skies Ordinance and our Brazilian Pepper Ordinance. And, and back then they, they actually tried to get a golf cart ordinance done and the county pushed back that they had no authority to, to do that. And so when they created all these panels, they basically said, hit us with your wish list. What's your wish? And they created these, these uh sub plans in the Lee plan, there's the North Captiva plan and in it, it says no internal combustion engines, right? Except for emergency vehicles, et cetera. And I think that's just created a lot of confusion for everyone because it's not a law. There's no ordinance, there, as, as Mike said, there's no enforcement mechanism. And so it's not illegal to operate uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle on the island. It's discouraged, it's definitely a long time uh, community standard, but I think that's where, you know, UCCA and then, and then all of us, you know, sort of individually have to perpetuate that community standard and put, you know, community and peer pressure on people to come on, please. You know, this is a different place. This is just different than, than the other islands. Um, but it's nothing that we can, you know, reach out to the county uh, or the sheriff's department and have them do anything. They can't do anything about it. Um, yeah, and I mean, as, as for those who weren't aware of what he was referencing with the golf carts, there is a state statute that does not allow golf carts to be operated on roads. It does allow counties and municipalities to create operational zones for golf carts to be used. So like Captiva from kind of South Seas, South to Tween Waters Inn, there is a zone created by county ordinance that allows golf carts to be operated in there. The problem is that the state statute and the county ordinance only cover operation on publicly maintained roads. Um, so that's where the problem is with the creation of an ordinance up there. And the fact that the state statute, which grants us the authority uh, to, to regulate that, only covers those publicly maintained roads. So uh, I, I think there was some discussion in that planning letter about the fact that the county just, they're, they're not they're they're not given the authority from the state to regulate that uh, in the same way that the internal combustion engine came about uh the question came about um so any, anything else on that or uh so i'll just uh julie i'll uh, i'll just say you know uh it's something we discuss a lot uh in ucca board meetings um i think that you know it's just going to take us trying to educate um, those who have carts and encourage them, uh, gas carts and encourage them to move them on um, and go electric. Uh, unfortunately, we're we're in sort of this uh, societal thing these days. It, it, if I push you, you just, you just push back harder and then I push back harder. And so, you know, trying to forcefully, um, you know, argue, I guess, or debate with people, hey, you can't have this gas vehicle on the island, it, it doesn't work. So I think we've just got to continue uh, trying to educate and, and just convince people that, look, to, there's a reason we all found North Captiva and it's very special. And, and we just got to convince them that, that that makes it not special. Yeah, I think uh, we discussed a little bit in the previous meeting the importance of kind of branding. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't mean that in a marketing sense, but more in the, the way you guys as a community project the acceptable behaviors and things up there on the island. Um, and, you know, that example starts with the people who live there. 
Um, but I think, you know, one of the persuasive things for people since, you know, I, I think there's a, a bit of a common interest in, in some of these things, with whether it's golf carts or internal combust combustion engines. Most of the residents, as you said, they moved to Upper Captiva for a reason. It's, it's quiet. It's nice. It's, it's immersed in nature and natural beauty. And I think that's really its charm. It's also the selling point of what brings people there on vacation. So the people that rent their houses and the businesses up there also have a vested interest in kind of, you know, a particular type of branding. But I think, again, it's up to you guys to come together as a community to kind of work out like, you know, what you want to project and how you want to accomplish that. Um, you know, to what level do you guys want to, you know, create, uh, you know, a, a, a body to help with like you have for the roads? I mean, do you have something else for landscape beautification or, you know, I mean, but it's all. Uh, got to kind of come from from you guys and it, it has to move from uh, you know conceptual ideas about you know what everybody wants and and one of the issues there of course is that every single person on that island has a different idea about what it should look like and what should be going on up there um, so I think you know as you said I mean there's a certain amount of uh, pressure and I don't mean that in a negative way there's even positive pressure that you can put on people as far as inclusiveness into some of these decisions and and being a part of these solutions that invest them into uh in into making things the way that you guys want up there but i think it is important that you guys have a series of meetings to work on that community consensus and and figure out what it is you want um you know similar to what's in that comprehensive plan maybe a bit updated a bit more specific and even a bit more actionable even from the grassroots level there on the island and i think that might help with a lot of these issues yeah um so i guess noise is the next yeah, let's thing talk noise okay we we did a lengthy discussion of noise on the last hall, a town hall meeting so i'll just do a real quick review of um the 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 main part of our ordinance uh and if anybody wants to read it it is in the lee county ordinances it's it's several pages long it has a few exceptions and a few criteria to to um to substantiate a noise violation but the clearest method for this and the one that we prefer to use is for residential land use, um, the maximum noise is 66 decibels uh, between, and, and that is measured from a receiving property. And I'll get back to that in a second. So it's 66 decibels between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. And it drops to 55 decibels uh, between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. So the, the language in there that receiving property and what makes that important is we have to, it says as measured or as observed from the receiving property. So when somebody calls us and just anonymously says, hey, there's loud noise here, it is all but impossible for us to move forward with, a, with any official action as far as citing somebody or bringing them to court or uh, anything like that, because we have to go to a receiving property to observe it. Um, so we do need a complainant. Um, we don't go marching up there and say, you know, hey, uh, Swin over here, two houses down, was upset about the noise and called the cops on you. We, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, but we do need to, if when we're substantiating the violation, we have to be able to go to the location of a complainant and measure that there is, in fact, a, a, a problem there. Um, what we have found is that there is an often a, a pretty wide gap between what individuals find annoying and what constitutes a violation of the law. It doesn't seem like like 66 or 55 decibels is really all that loud. Um, it seems pretty low, um, but when you're measuring it from a distance away, uh, it, it does take quite a lot to reach those uh, sound pressure readings, those decibel counts. Um, my advice would be, especially if you have a house that is a kind of a constant problem or it's not enough for a violation, but it is at that annoying range, is uh, make, make inroads with some of the management companies. Um, sometimes what we found on Captiva especially is that the, uh, the, the, the things left at the house for people to use, I mean, an outdoor ping pong table on, on the pool deck or uh, outdoor stereo system or whatever contributes to uh, a, a longstanding problem with the neighbors that can be corrected just because nobody really knows it's a problem, you know, but by going to the management company or to the owner of the house saying, hey, man, those outside speakers are really getting to be a problem. I mean, maybe we can replace that with a little small battery powered 
speaker that they you know can use a rechargeable one uh, instead of rigging up like a massive stereo out the back. Uh, the other thing we found is a lot of these houses are just built where you have a concrete pool deck and a block wall or a solid wall uh, that you know for the house and then privacy walls along the side and it just creates a, like a sound funnel. So the people that live behind there, they might as well just be sitting in the li living room with the people listening to music or or talking or or whatever. Um, so, you know, sometimes that's a better option if it doesn't rise to the level of a legal violation is to just work with the management company and the owner. And uh, obviously, we're we're happy to help out with that too, as as a a, a bit of a community issue. Um, you know, we can if if people are shy about bringing it up to the management companies or the neighbors. It's something that uh, even though we can't force a solution on it, we can certainly help to bring it to their attention. Um, and, uh, Mike in the, in the chat, um, it's been brought, what about business noise? So, you know, in so there is, there is a the bars can get pretty loud. There, well, there is a commercial, um, there is some commercial uh, things in there, but it's still going to depend on the, the land use of the receiving property. That's, that's my, recollection of that ordinance right at, at the moment and if i uh look at it a little later and discover that's not the case um then i'll, I'll get back with you but i i seem to remember it's something like 77 decibels or so i think it's just up another one and then of course if it's a industrial area it's it's a different level i mean there's a whole list of exceptions and exemptions in there but i think most of the people that would be affected by something in there would be under that those residential guidelines, the 66 and 55 decibel readings. Yeah. And then is there is there a time uh there uh what time do, do the in are there two different levels? It's up to like yes. 10 p.m. and then 10 p.m. to like 7 a.m. Yeah. 7 so it's it's 10 from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. it's 66 decibels at the receiving property. And after 10 p.m. it drops to 55 until you get to 7 a.m. And, you know, there's some, like I said, if anybody's interested enough, they can read. There's some exemptions for like emergency repair work, for public utilities, for emergency response. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's some what you would imagine to be reasonable exemptions in there. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think probably the inference here is, is you know, some of the bars like Island Club, right? You know, uh, not not so much this year necessarily, but, you know, prior to the hurricane, open to midnight blare in the music actually gets louder after 10 just <laughs> up and everything. So um, anyway, I think the, the, the big takeaway there for everyone is that it, it, the complaint has to come from the receiving property and, and the DB level has to be sustained above that level at that right. property. And, and short impulse noises. I mean, you know, like if it's basically not at that level, it has to be kind of a, continuous or repetitive thing like some kids jumping in the pool and going like we that's not gonna okay oh it spiked to 66 decibels that's not going to be a, a violation um it, it has to be like a sustained noise i mean loud music or you know somebody running equipment or something like that there's you know those are the kinds of things that we would be uh be talking about um any other questions on noise no. Nope. Okay. Um, leash law. Uh, I, I mentioned. We, did, we, did, yeah, we didn't talk about this one last year. Last time. Yes, we did not. Um, there is a leash law that covers all of Lee County, including Upper Captiva. Um, so uh, a dog has to be under the actual physical control of the owner or handler, um, what have you. And actual physical control under the county definition is a leash of eight feet or less. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm guilty of using like a, a big retractable lead with with my dog sometimes, um, but not when I'm out walking down the street or in a group of people or whatever. I mean, if I'm, I'm out just running or something, whatever, but it to meet the uh, the actual uh, requirements of that ordinance, actual physical control is on a lead eight feet or less. Uh, that is when the dog is off of your property. So your dog does not need to be leashed on your own property, but it does need to be suitably contained within the property. So, I mean, if it's charging off the property 
and chasing after a person or a dog, it's you're now in violation because it's off of your property at that point. Um, but you know, you can have your dog off the leash as long, I mean, as long as your recall is good or you have a solid fence, then they can be off leash on your own property or on somebody else's property with the uh property owner's permission. Um but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we get a lot of complaints about this for North Captiva. Um, and we we have it a lot down here too. I mean, people take their dogs out to the beach and they want the dogs to be able to run around and, and have fun. And I understand that uh, the desire to let your dog run free, but um, the leash law exists for a number of reasons. I mean, the, the number one thing everybody says to us when we pull up to them and talk to them about leash law is, don't worry about it. My dog is really friendly. And we, that's what we, I mean, every time I, I don't think I've ever had anybody not say that to me. Um, the purpose of the leash law is not to assess whether your dog is friendly or not. Um, you know, first of all, a lot of people judge their dog to be friendly and suddenly the dog, uh, you know, gets a wild air about something and is suddenly not friendly. Um, and that, that can be the unpredictable nature of dogs, but also, uh, it protects you, uh, if, your dog is really friendly and goes running up to somebody's 250 pound Siberian mountain crusher. Well, and your dog gets mauled. Who's at fault there? I mean, you are because your dog is not under actual physical control. Uh, so it's to protect you. It's to protect your dog. Um, we live on barrier islands with sensitive wildlife areas. So it protects the wildlife, uh, particularly nesting birds. We have a big problem with that with people letting dogs run off leash. Uh, in the turn nesting habitat and snowy plover habitat, it causes disruptions that can keep them from nesting there for, for years after that. So it, it's important that they're on a leash. Uh, and last of all, you know, some people are just terrified of dogs. And it's not fair as a dog owner to impose your dog, friendly or not, on somebody who's afraid of dogs. They, they have a right to enjoy the public spaces just like everybody else without being terrorized. Uh, or terrified, as it may be, depending on the nature of the dog. Uh, but for, for those reasons, it's, you know, it's the background of the leash law. And if all of those fail to prevail on your senses, um, you'll have to go to court about it. So, uh, you know. Hey, hey Mike, so I got a question here. So uh, let, let's say that someone is walking uh, with their dog with not on a leash uh, and that dog goes, you know, after someone or, or someone else's pet, uh, what can the, the, the defending person do? Like if that person walks with a big stick, can it hit the dog and they hit the dog? Well, I, I, I'm a little, uh, reluctant to get into hypotheticals about that sure. because a lot of these situations are nuanced to the point. I get a lot of questions about like, well, if somebody breaks into my house, can I shoot them? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, so for that, for the same reason that I tend to kind of beg off on that a little bit, I'll do it here too, because I don't want to be misinterpreted on a, uh, uh, on, a, on, on any specifics, but in broad sense, yeah, you can defend yourself and defend your, your dog. I mean, that's, uh, I would encourage you to talk to animal control or to, uh, you know, an attorney about specific situations. But um, yeah, in the broad sense, you certainly can protect your yourself and, and, and your dog, which is considered property under the law. So. Gotcha. Uh, oh, uh, da -da. so uh, can you address picking up after your dog versus burying the waste someone told me you can bury it off your property yeah no I, I don't think you can I think it's um you, you can't deposit uh or leave I have to remember the exact wording um but there is wording about that you you have to remove dog waste from those areas so um again there is a, there there is an ordinance under our animal control section that covers it um, and there's also mention of human and, and animal waste in the beach and dune protection sections. So, I mean, if you're talking specifically about, can I just, you know, dig a hole with a, a seashell and kick it in there? Uh, no, it, it does need to be removed from the, from the beach in particular. I, I know it can't be left to remain there. So uh, as far as other places, I, I'm not really certain about that, but I think the language is substantially similar about removing waste. 
Mike, um, I, I put the ordinance in the chat and that is addressed in that ordinance. Good. I'm glad you're you're there paying attention. <laughs> awesome. Uh, any question, any other questions for Mike on on the leash law? Okay. We'll move on. All right. So there are, are some questions about LCSO presence. Um, and so since uh, receiving your, your invitation, we've tried to pull up a bunch of the stats. Uh, unfortunately, it's gotten a little muddied because of uh, our transition to a new dispatch and records software. So it will take me a little bit longer to get specific numbers than I, I had available to me. I have to get an analyst to pull it because uh, of a coding issue uh, with, with our dispatchers. So that's been corrected at this point. But going back from uh, really just uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, back through, uh, I can't remember when we switched over to this program, but it's been about a year. Uh, it takes a, a lot more access and ability than I readily have available to me. So, but I can speak to you in broad terms about it. Um, myself, Chris or Christine are on North Captiva just about daily. Um, we are up there sometimes more than once a day. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have uh, some overlap in patrol with our Marine unit and with the uh, upper Captiva, uh, rather the uh, Boca Grand deputies. Um, I don't want to get too specific about our patrol strategies because, um, you know, some of those are held close to the vest as a crime control and prevention measure. But we do uh, try to vary the times. Um, we you know, one of the principles for us is to not be predictable in our patrols. I mean, if things become too routine, it becomes pretty easy to avoid us. Um, but I will also say that um, the, the crime on North Captiva has been just very, very low. Um, I know there's been a, a lot of rumors about um, crime and about looting and construction theft and things like that. But I think Chris had one report that he actually took and christine did you take any up there no nope. just one so i mean we're talking about uh you know single digit numbers on actual reports um but of uh, even of some of the ones that we've gone and explored we've tracked down uh we found that they haven't really been thefts uh some of them have been uh, civil disputes with between the homeowner and the contractor or misunderstanding about who actually owns the materials. Um, and just kind of as a point of law, uh, you do not own the materials that a contractor brings to your site. Uh, the contractor owns them until the job is done. Unless you have purchased those materials by yourself, wholly separate from the contract and from the contractor. Um, so, you know, if I went and bought everything to build a fence and then hired the, the contractor, I would own those materials. If I hire a guy to install a fence and he goes, great, I'll build you a fence. And he goes out, sources the materials, sets them up. He owns all those materials. And that includes overages from the from the construction. Um, you know, that's kind of where that point of law comes in most often is disputes in what happens to leftover materials. Um, but what we've been finding is, uh, you know, there's been a little bit of borrowing between contractors. Um there has been some cases of just uh, poor accountability for the location of tools and materials where people are saying, oh, somebody stole all my tools. And they're stomping around the island telling everyone that their tools were stolen and blah, blah, blah. And then we go to track it down. They go, oh, no, you know what? I actually found those. I, one of my guys took them to a different site. So a, a lot of what we're finding is that nobody's going back and correcting the impression that they've left on the island about some of these thefts. And that's not to say there aren't thefts going on, but as far as what's been reported to us, it, it's been very minimal. Um, uh, we've also had at least one case where a contractor uh, claimed that things were stolen um, because they were overextended and they uh, were getting a little bit of grief from the homeowner about the timeline. And so they told the homeowner that materials have been stolen when in fact they hadn't been, they just uh, needed more time to do the work. Um, I don't know how common that is. I don't want to imply that that's the norm for up there, but uh, it is a, a circumstance that we have encountered up there. Uh, so we, 
if you have a theft, we would like to know about it and we'd like to follow up on it. We'd like to investigate it. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're dealing with the person who has standing to report the theft. And most of the times in these uh, construction cases, the person with the standing to report the theft, the actual victim is going to be the contractor. Um, so if you, the contractor is telling you they've had a bunch of stuff stolen, but doesn't want to report it to us, um, you know, I, I don't know why they wouldn't want to, but it, it might be something you'd want to ask them. <laughs> so, well, it, interestingly, uh, the 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 sort of banter around theft that that I've sort of saw uh, and and heard from people, you know, over the last couple of months has really subsided since the. Uh, subcontractor who was doing debris removal on the island was fired and removed. So, I, I think, and you know that I think some been, of that might have might have gone away. That that's really been the dynamic of a lot of the post storm thefts is uh, the guys that we have in in hard hats and fluorescent vests are fixing things during the day and uh, eyeballing stuff, uh, you know, on their way in and out from the job sites. Um, we've been fortunate on Captiva that we, we were spared most of those incidents, but um, they had, uh, I, I believe, charged a few of the recovery workers down on Sanibel with uh, burglaries and thefts. Um, so hopefully that, I, I think most of the people who are island residents uh, are not thieves. I don't think you guys are up there commonly stealing from each other and uh, most of the businesses and, and stuff up there are pretty much above board. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that this subsided and, and hopefully that'll put paid to that, that trend. Yeah. Uh, the, I guess the other part of that, Mike, is, you know, evenings seem to be when the most egregious things happen. How, how often are you guys on the island in the, in the evenings? We are more commonly there during the day. Um, we do go up there at night. Um, whether we're, I mean, typically if we ever get any dispatch calls, we remain on the island for a while just to make sure that uh, either the problem has subsided or if it's not something that requires action. Like far and away, our most common call for North Captiva Island by, by orders of magnitude is a 911 hang up call. Um, it's the, the cell phone pocket dial, the dreaded cell phone pocket dial. Uh, they happen all towers of the day and night. And if we can't, uh, uh, get the information we need to you know basically put that call down before uh, response is required then we have to go up there to respond so whether through our routine patrol or our patrol strategy or because of dispatch calls we do end up on north captiva quite a bit at night and when we are there we try to spend some time up there but just you know uh as my own observation i mean having spent hundreds you know, probably thousands of documented hours up on Upper Captiva at all hours of the day and night. Um, we pretty much don't encounter criminal activity through regular patrol up there. Um, I, I think, again, I mean, some of this goes back to that gulf between what's illegal and what's annoying. And we have people saying things like, well, there's just people driving golf carts around all night. And so, like, yeah, I, I can see how that would be irritating to people. But if you're driving down uh, you know, at night to borrow a cup of sugar from one of your neighbors, should the police pounce on you from the bushes and take you to jail for that? Well, no. And, you know, similarly, we can't treat other people that same way. We, you know, we have to treat people with a, a, a certain amount of equality. Well, not even a certain amount of equality, period. And uh, there's, there's not kind of one law for island residents and one law for island visitors. Um, so that goes back to communicating your expectations to visitors on the island um, and, uh, uh, you know, communicating your own rules and having a way to enforce your rules, you know, um, because it, it's, it's just not a, a ready solution for us to go up there and just tell people, hey, you know, it's, it's 11 p.m., no more golf carts. It's just not something we can do or, you know, so. Uh, we're we're left to the strictures of the ordinances and the state statutes on that. Right on. Any uh, any other questions from anyone regarding um, the sheriff's department presence on the island? I do have one more statement about yeah. it. Though. If you have a problem with a house that's a particular issue or whatever, feel free to 
call or text me or Chris or Christine and just say, hey, you know, it's, it's not urgent. It doesn't require an immediate response. But, you know, this house has, has really kind of been a bit of a problem. They might benefit from seeing uh, a badge up there. And we'll put them on our list of, of extra patrol uh, over the next few days just to make sure that, you know, that particular group or that street is reminded of our presence. You know, we are up there a lot, but we don't encounter everybody all the time we're there. You know, a lot of times people are out on a section of the beach that we can't get a cart out onto that we observe. Uh, we, you know, we observe the golf beach quite a lot, but we don't have a way to really get out on there readily to go drive past everybody. Um, you know, there are, if somebody's inside their house or in their pool, we're probably not going to encounter them unless they're out on the street. Um, so again, I mean, you know, one of the things that's very, very important in our community policing model is a partnership with you guys as residents and business owners, uh, and keeping a good line of communication available so that we're aware of problems. And even if it, it's not a, 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 a enforcement action to be taken, there is sometimes some steps we can take to reduce and, and, you know, kind of reduce the harm of some of these things for you. Hey, Swain, it's Dave Bankatee. Uh, hey, Dave. I'm not sure. I think this would be the appropriate time. And if it's not, we can certainly delay it. Uh, I have real concerns about waterway safety uh, and boating traffic. Uh, sure. So, out of so we, we, we are going to get to that in a separate topic. Dave. Beautiful. I will hold yep. on. Yeah. OK, <laughs> great. Um, I, I think the next one we have on here, there was a question about um, uh, camera registry for our real-time intelligence center. And, and right now there is not a camera registry. Um, we, when we have an incident up there, we do try to canvas and look for cameras on nearby, you know, buildings and, and businesses and, and what have you. Um, if you guys do hear about a crime or something up there and, and you think you may have gotten video of it, uh, please reach out to us and let us know. I mean, a lot of times the video, even if we can't see a specific person or identify a specific suspect, what we can do is determine an exact time of the offense. We can determine a direction of travel and sometimes be able to use other cameras along that path to kind of pinpoint where they may have gone or to find better video of somebody. Um, so, you know, it's it's when, when we have an incident up there and, you know, thankfully it's very rare for North Captiva. But it is helpful for us to use those as puzzle pieces to, um, to you know, to to solve crimes and and uh, video has become increasingly important in prosecutions as well. So uh, yeah, oh my I, mean, God. I, I guess I might have been uh, confused about that. I I thought that the real time intelligence center had a way for for people to to document that they had cameras in case you guys were looking. So, so there had been discussion early on. I think I brought this up maybe the last time that we had a meeting or even before that. They were discussing um, a camera registry for that reason to make it basically to simplify our process of canvassing a neighborhood after after a crime. Sure. Um, right now, it's just not. As you might imagine, for a county the size of Lee County, that it's is a, lot a, of a massive stuff. undertaking. Right. And so there's a lot of questions about how that would be maintained, who would maintain it, what intervals. So, I mean, at, at this time, it, it's not, there isn't one. Um, and I asked about it not that long ago, and I don't think it's anywhere on the immediate horizon. Uh, I think it's a good idea, but um, I, I just don't think we're quite there with it yet. Maybe it's something UCCA can do since we have a golf cart registry, do a camera registry. Yeah, I mean, if there was a, an unofficial one that you guys were, were uh willing to you know obviously voluntarily uh put on there that yes i have cameras at my at my home that face out and where they face out to and all that stuff um and that would be something that uh we could have a point of contact with on the island to ask hey what do you have in this area um that would be you know that that could be helpful for us uh but that would have to be something that you guys all agreed to and generated and maintained yourselves and just um you know, uh, uh, that that would be up for you guys to discuss and determine how you want to manage that. Awesome. Uh, all right, on to unruly island guests. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this is this could be a long uh, this could be a long thing here, I guess. But 
Um, so again, we get into the definition of unruly. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to once again invoke that divide between annoying and illegal. Um, so I, I think a lot of when people have, have brought it up to us, that some of their bigger complaints are just kind of, you know, people riding on golf carts, uh, you know, people playing music from golf carts, um, you know, walking around and just being boisterous and that sort of thing. None of those things on their face are illegal. Um, and so I think the, the main question that you guys have is about access. Um, you know, obviously, if they're committing a crime, it's us. Call us. We'll, we'll come up. We'll take care of them. Um, but as far as just people doing something that you just kind of don't like as you're peering through your blinds and tis tisking, uh, not really much we can do to help with that one. Um, as far as access, uh, um, uh, and I'm sorry, that, that was a little bit flip of me there. I, I, I don't mean to uh, cast dispersions on anyone or their, uh, their concerns. It's not that it's not a valid concern, but uh, there, there is, again, that gulf between what we can do about it and what we just kind of have to tolerate as living in a society with other people nearby us. Um, so the access, I, I'm not really aware of anything that would prevent people from being able to walk on the, uh, on the roads up there, on the easements. Um, you guys probably know better than I do what it says in the foundation of those easements, but the, my recollection of it, uh, I haven't read it from a long time ago, is that it's basically uh, a public easement that allows people to cross. Um, so whether there's any legal prohibition of it, I'm not aware of one, but I will say that there's really not a, a practical way to address that. I mean, there, there's not really a way to know if that person walking by your house uh, is a guest of another house, uh, a, you know, a property owner from out of town, a day boat. There's just not really a practical way to, to know it in a way that we could address that. I mean, I think what I would do is encourage you guys to look for illicit behavior and uh, let us know if there's a problem with that. I and mean, people are breaking stuff or, you know, going in around houses. I mean, those are the things that we would be most concerned about. But somebody just walking down the middle of the street is, uh, there, there's not really anything practical to be done with that. Um, and let's hear, I think we had, there's a, there's another one I want to skip to real quick first, because I think there was a, uh, specifically somebody wanting to know about access. It was, goes under the boaters thing. Um, Oh, like boaters, boaters coming in, boaters, ab boater at private docks or, or right, right. So I'll boaters. leave the private docks until we get over there. But there was something about people anchoring and uh, being on the shoreline. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, they can be there. So the state of Florida uh, owns all waterways and submerged lands in the state of Florida. There's a sovereign la sovereign lands of the state of Florida. And by extension, it belongs to all of us. Um, so, uh, kind of to, there, there's a couple of definitions and without getting too deep into it, if they're below the mean high tide line, um, which for our purposes is kind of the sandy portion of the beach, because that's the area that is affected by a normal cycle of tides and storms. Um, they're fine to be out there. Um, they can anchor up, they can come out, they can enjoy the beach and enjoy the shoreline. Um, where it becomes a bit of a problem is if they are getting up onto like the curtilage of one of your properties. I mean, if they're up there under a house. Um, and again, we, we've even had an issue there where houses have, <laughs> where the, the high tide line has gone up underneath the house. Well, that's still actually an area of public thoroughfare. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the people's beach, the people's area. So that, that, Tidal margin belongs to all of us. So there's not really anything that can be done to keep people from anchoring up or, or coming ashore. Yeah. So I just felt that one tied in pretty well with the, the, yeah, with the visitors moving around the island. So it's, it's more of an access yeah. question. Um, I, I think that'll move us, unless somebody has a, a specific question about that, I'll move to some of the uh, stuff about the bars. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I don't want to single out 
anybody at this point other than to say that um, with kind of it only being the only bar that's open right now, um, I, I know people have brought up the North Captiva Island Club, the, the Mangoes Bar, as kind of being the epicenter of most of the complaints that, that I've received. Um, I will say that the management of, uh, of the Island Club has been proactively reaching out to us to try to find ways to mitigate some of the worst of this behavior. Um, so I, I feel like there is a, um, at least a, a pretty good potential to have them on board as, as part of the solution to these problems. Um, however, so we do once again get back into the realm of, you know, is the behavior criminal or is it just distasteful? Um, you know, people doing body shots and stuff like that. I mean, I, 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 it's not within my margin of sanitary uh, consumption, but, uh, you know, to each their own. Um, so what I would say is if you have a criminal act occurring up there, then that's within our, our realm. If it's more a pattern of undesirable behaviors and, uh, uh, and, and un general unruliness that radiates from any licensed business, um, then you can contact the Florida uh, Department of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco. So that's Florida ABT. Um, one of the uh, license requirements for any uh, uh, liquor license holder, beer, wine, or liquor license holder in the state is that they have to maintain dominion and control over their license premises. Um, so if you have a, if there is a business that has, and, and I'm speaking in general terms right now, um, if there's a business, whether it's here on Captiva, on North Captiva, over in Fort Myers, the licensee has to have dominion and control over what goes on there. They're responsible for the conduct and, and responsible for things that happen on their property. Um, so I would say if it's if it's more that kind of problem, uh, that is a complaint that's that's best routed to ABT because that is something that they can sanction the license. Um, they can you know suspend licenses, they can fine licenses, and they can rescind licenses. Um, so. I would say on a on a on the level of really abating a problem, you know, do you go after the guy who gets off a boat and takes a, a body shot off of somebody in a bikini, or do you bring it up as a potential problem with the license holder and let ABT look at it to see if there's a pattern of behavior to put a stop to it? Um, I, I would argue that it's more effective to uh, to get to the source of the problem and encourage that the licensee maintains that dominion and control. Um, so uh, that Mike, is, going back to a hybrid of, of that and the boaters, uh, there's a question, what, what should we do when we notice visibly intoxicated boaters trying to boat off? Who do we call? Well, um, you know, if they're clearly and visibly intoxicated, so we, we've often run into Things where, especially people who are already upset about a particular place or issue, starts calling us and saying, oh, Pete, they're, they're drunk. Everybody's drunk. And we go out and we, we stop somebody and they're not. And it's because they're, I think, you know, not, not in a dishonest way, but have reached a, a certain point with the problem where they assume that the problem is occurring every time. Now, that being said, if you see somebody who's just absolutely schnozzled getting on to and operating a vessel, then absolutely call call the sheriff's office, um, and we'll go ahead get a direction of travel, a description of the boat, description of the occupants, and uh, get we'll get somebody on the way up there. Um, but that being said, not every person leaving a bar and getting into a boat is drunk. Some of these people are the D, basically the DD. Uh, some people are operating within a responsible level of consumption. So what I want to make sure we're very careful about is that we don't adopt a pattern of sitting outside of the bar and just calling the sheriff's office every five minutes for every boat that leaves an establishment, a licensed establishment. Um, but of course, if there's something that's posing a public safety risk, an immediate public safety risk, then we, we absolutely want to be a part of that. So. Cool. Uh, any questions from anyone regarding activity at island businesses, bars, stuff like that? 
Uh, that'll take us, Mike, uh, still in, in visitors, and this this was brought up uh, a little while ago, uh, touching on evictions, right? Two years ago when we did this, uh, we, we were in the height of the Tampa high schoolers that invaded the island and, and some evictions happened. So you want to talk through that process? And sure. So, so there's two, basically two classes of uh, occupants in a, uh, a place that's rented or, le or leased. Um, obviously, there's a, 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 a basically a permanent resident, a residential occupant. Okay, somebody who's rented that as their primary place of, uh, of residence. It's kind of where they have registered to vote, where they get their mail, where they keep all their toothbrushes and underwear. And, you know, if those if somebody's saying, I, I live in this house, this is my home, then you have to go through a, a lengthy eviction process through the courts. Um, anybody who needs that information specifically, we can come up with a link for you to there, there's information through the clerk of courts on how to evict uh, like a long term tenant, you know, a residential tenant. A transient occupant is the other type. And that I think is what we're mostly talking about here, which are is like a hotel guest or a um, uh, like a vacation rental, short term vacation rental guest. You know, that's not their home. They're just staying there for, you know, a, a short duration. Um, generally, that's going to have a fixed start and end time. Um, and those people can be readily removed from the property. Um, I, I sent you earlier as an attachment. Yeah. If you want to distribute that to people, that's fine. Um, we have like kind of a little worksheet and an affidavit uh, that when a property owner wants us to remove a transient occupant from their property, uh, we send that to them. They look through and there's a bunch of criteria um, that kind of helps us to differentiate whether they're a, a, a residential occupant or a transient occupant. And upon the affidavit of the property owner, um, uh, basically saying here, I filled this all out. I swear that all of this is, swear affirm all this is true. And I want this person removed. Um, then they can be removed from that, that house or that property. They don't have any property right to it as a transient occupant. So um, the one quirk of that is that under the law, they are entitled to be uh, refunded, like on a prorated scale, the unused portion of their stay. Um, I know that sometimes comes into uh, into play with um, with rental companies and stuff. They say, "Well, we don't want these people here." Okay, um, but you know they can ask for their money back. Never mind, we're not that upset about it. So, uh, <laughs> what what we will do though is is like I said, you have that information there. Um, Anybody who wants to review it, obviously you can you can email that out to them and they can kind of take a look. Um, but it is important information for people, especially if you own a rental home or uh, work for a rental company. So yeah, uh, it, like it, it's we, important we, to know what you can do. We did have a question, so similar, uh, a little different. This is someone uh, overstaying. If a short-term uh, rental renter stays past the checkout time and refuses to leave, can they be evicted? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that would be one of the classic examples. I mean, you know, we we get this a lot. I mean, the, the, the most typical thing countywide would be like a hotel guest. You know, they start tearing up their room or they're, you know, they're up there smoking in their room in a non-smoking room and they've just been a general nuisance to everybody and the management's just like, nope, they got to go. But that also would apply to to them being there past their, their time. They could be made to leave. I, I would ask that, People, you know, try their best to resolve something like that. I mean, I know that sometimes the ferry, they aren't ready to get on the ferry. So, you know, there's some kind of reason. I mean, you know, uh, it, use use your best judgment, but, uh, you know, try to resolve it before calling us. This, you know, we don't want a bunch of calls at 12.01. At uh, and, you know, the person has no idea that it's even a problem because nobody's told them that i mean we're we're not there to to do the job of property managers um but we're happy to intervene if they run into a problem where the the renter is uh refusing to leave or or if there's some other problem we're happy to go up there but uh uh you you'll have to start paying us the big bucks as property managers if you want us to just do that job <laughs> yeah and so the uh the transient occupancy affidavit that mike sent we we're going to be uh, adding some some news slash blog posts to the UCCA website. We'll, we'll 
create a story about evictions and we'll include that document. So if anyone ever needs it, you can go there and find it. And, okay. and I believe Chris put it in the chat here if, if anyone yeah. wants to save that link. Yeah, Mike, so one of the things I was approached about a couple of weeks ago was, um, and I've only been approached about it by one person, but they were concerned. I know some, some of the residents have allowed the workers to stay in their homes to help mitigate um, travel time and, and maybe they're getting a break on the job like this person was because they were providing the residents. You know, this eviction thing could come into play if some of you guys are doing that because they, at some point, and every circumstance is going to be a little different, but they may no longer be considered a transient occupant depending on the circumstances. So uh, if you're in that situation, you've had people staying there for the past five, six, seven months, um, you might want to start thinking about a plan, not saying that these people would give you a hard time. I'm, I'm sure they're all, um, you know, outstanding citizens. And, and, and once the job is done, they'll pack up and leave. But in case you run into that circumstance, we need to make sure that we kind of bone up, read up on that link that I put in the chat there and make sure that, you know, the steps that you need to take to protect yourself, protect your property. Um, and that way we know the difference between something that we can do as law enforcement or something that's just going to turn out to be a civil matter between you and the employee that you hired. Right. And, th and then you'll have to go through that eviction process through the courts. Um, you know, I mean, somebody who's been living there five or six months, uh, they can pretty easily argue, hey, this is where I live now and you're going to have to evict me. And, you know, they can stretch that out for a while, uh, you know, so something to consider for, for those of you that have workers staying in your house. Interesting. All right, uh, any other questions for uh, Mike and the, and the team about unruly island guests or the bars or uh, evicting renters or just anything in general that, that we might have missed that you want to ask? All right, no? Okay. That's when the question about legal dumping is still. What's that? Question oh. about illegal dumping. Oh, we're, we'll, we'll get to it. We're going to get to that. Good deal. Um, I think we had a question about trespassing. Yeah. Um, basically, trespassing is like uh, willingly and intentionally entering or remaining on the property of another. That's kind of a slimmed down version of the of the statute. Um, but it's, you know, without the permission or remaining after permission has been withdrawn. Um, and that is usually a required step for us to prosecute trespass and most trespassing. Um, there are some exceptions uh, in there for, for uh, you know, being in the cartilage of a home or trespassing within a structure. Um, that would be one that, you know, would, well, that wouldn't really require uh, notice. I mean, if somebody breaks in a house to live there, that's, you know, uh, that's pretty clear. Um, but if you're just talking about somebody like out in your yard or on a business property or, whatever, um, generally they would have to be informed that they need to leave the property and their failure to leave after warning constitutes that trespass offense. Yeah. So if, if someone is just walking through my yard, they walk into my yard from the road and they transverse it and go out the back into another property, that could yeah, I mean, it, it would, it would, there would be a few things we'd have to examine on the specific case by case, but um, generally it would be more like, uh, you know, for, for, yeah, I mean, if they're sitting out there, not like in your house, not under the, you know, not like sitting under it or whatever. I mean, if they're just kind of out there, you know, they got a couple feet on your property or one of your neighbors is standing there talking to you about, news and weather and you want them to leave <laughs> you got to tell them to leave you know they're they're, they're not trespassing if, they, if they've not been informed that they're not supposed to be there so um you know there are some things about fences there are some uh things about posting property if you are somebody who has like a recurring problem with trespassers then you know get with us and we'd be glad to meet up with you and look at your specific property your specific circumstance and you know give us a, a good understanding of what the problem is with the trespassing and we'd be able to advise probably a lot better about you know the best way to proceed and also if it requires um specific marking or signage or something we'd, we'd be glad to let you know about that too 
Yeah, I think I think probably the 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 biggest issue with potential trespassing on the island these days is is with docks. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so the docks and that that's gotten a little worse too after the storm because uh it, you know it looks like most of your docks up there are either in good shape or on their way to being in better shape. But we've certainly had problems around other parts of the county where you know docks are destroyed. So a lot of people have said, well, you know, I have legitimate business here, but uh, you know, all the dock I normally use is is destroyed. So I'm just gonna pull up to this one real quick. And we've run into that a few times, uh, you know, around other parts of the county. Um, and, you know, because the people don't mean any harm, they think that they're not causing harm. Um, and, but yeah, I mean, people can't use your dock without permission. So a permitted dock structure that belongs to and is, you know, properly uh, placed by the property owner is the, 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 is the property of that property owner. So the water surrounding it is not. We get a lot of calls from people saying, oh, there's somebody near my dock fishing and I don't like it. Well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you just have to not like it because, as I mentioned earlier, the water itself, the waterways belong to the state. And so uh, somebody can go up to your dock. They can go under your dock. They can go around your dock. Uh, they just can't tie up to it. They can't get out and use your dock. Sometimes those points of law are lost on people because, you know, there's not really a uh, comprehensive boating license required for people. They just go out and, you know, if you have a credit card with a high enough limit on it, well, you're welcome to the world of boating. So, um, you know, other than people that are required to have a bobber card, and even then it doesn't generally cover the, the law and etiquette of using these docks. So, if you are particularly affected by people using your dock, I would advise you to put up no trespassing signs. Um, you know, this is a common problem further down the island around like, you know, Foster Bay and South Banks and, wow. you know, over there on the other side up by Paywan. Um, a lot of those homeowners have solved that problem by putting gates, you know, locked gates and some of them will put, you know, fencing or, or wings off the side to discourage people from you know, climbing around and using their docks. Um, you know, those strategies are by and large successful. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, they they really, people can't use your dock without permission, so. And so what what is the consequence? Uh, let's say that someone comes and, or I, I go to my dock and there's a boat moored at my dock and like now, now I can't moor to my dock, there's someone's here. Yeah, so here that gets a little bit thorny. I mean, obviously, if they are there, if they're present, then we can deal with it like any other trespassing. Sure. Hey, I, you need to leave my dock. No, I'm not going to leave. Okay, well, we're going to call the sheriff then and we'll get this settled. And most of the time, once you get on the phone, they might stand there for a minute or two to win the argument, but then they're going to hop in the boat and leave. Um, they, they, Most people don't really want to be there when we get there. So, uh, But if you come out and a boat is just tied up to your dock, um, there isn't really, so what you can do, you can contact a company that regularly and routinely operates in the, basically the towing and impounding of boats. Um, you know, or like the boot, the booting industry. It would boats. be, it's, it's very similar to, to the way you do with like a private property tow. The problem is, uh, what companies actually do that, um, you know, even if they're legally authorized, some of them just decide the juice isn't worth the squeeze on going all the way out to somewhere and then finding the car, the boat's gone by the time they get there. Um, you know, they don't want to be responsible for impounding and keeping this boat. Um, you know, there's a lot of hurdles to it that some of these companies may not want to engage in. So maybe as a proactive measure, if you're having this happen enough and you've tried signs, you've tried gates, you've tried all the other things reach out to one of the, uh, you know, the, the boat towing companies and see if you can't work out some sort of a, a response agreement with them um, or at least feel them out about it. So when that happens, uh, you, you have some recourse. What you cannot do is just untie the boat and push it out. Um, and, you know, there we've reviewed this with our Marine unit. Um, there's some, uh, some foundation for that to be like a theft 
Um, but moreover, it's also a, uh, a, a, a reckless hazard to navigation by just setting a boat adrift and pushing it out. Um, so yeah, I mean, your, your options are kind of limited on that. Uh, and then uh, part of that, is it illegal to walk on or over someone's dock? No, not without their permission. Um, the, I mean, now again, I, I would encourage, sometimes when we talk to, to folks up there, and it's not just North Captiva, it's, it's kind of all over the place. You know, we kind of get into um, a lot of these arguments about, is this okay? Is this not okay? And I, I, we need to take sometimes a broader view about, you know, what people's intent are and what level they would be expected to know some of this. I mean, if I'm here on vacation from, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Kansas, something like that, what I know that when I'm walking down the beach, if I step over somebody's dock that I'm in violation, I, I would not. And, you know, what, if you were on vacation in one of those places and you, uh, you know, did some infraction against somebody like that, how would you want to be dealt with and, and, and how, what kind of response would you want? I mean, would you want a, somebody to say, okay, somebody stepped on my dock for, they, they were on there for two and a half seconds and they moved on down the beach. Is it worth making yourself crazy about? And if it is enough of an issue for you, what's the best way to respond to that? You know, maybe just a, hey, you know, just FYI, you know, it's my dock and, and you really can't be on it. You, you can go around it or you can go back out to the street at this access and around, but you can't really be on my dock. You know, I mean, it's it's up to people to determine how they want to do it. It's not really practical for us to chase down everybody that's momentarily stepping over a dock. Um, they're already gone by the time we get there. It's a, even at the worst, it's a misdemeanor that has not occurred in our presence. So um, it, it's not something we can go and arrest them for right there on site. You'd have to fill out um, a citizen complaint form and write a report basically that would be submitted to misdemeanor intake. And they would determine whether or not there's probable cause to issue a summons or an arrest warrant for that person. And I think when that says that this person walked over my dock and was present on it for two and a half seconds, I think that they would be disinclined to, I don't want to speak for them, maybe they would, but I, I think that they would be disinclined to issue a summons or warrant for that. So um, again, I mean, this is where signage helps. You have a lot of people visiting your island that aren't from there. And it's, you have to think about the most effective way to convey information about the acceptable standard. So uh, legal, no, but you know, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things we have to exercise some discretion on collectively as homeowners and law enforcement. So. And just going back to general trespassing, does a no trespassing sign count as notice? It can. Um, there are some requirements for the signage um, and certain types of land have to be marked in different ways and some land types don't have to be marked at all. So I, I, <laughs> I put the statute in the chat. And uh, in there, it gives you all the definitions and what the sign requirements are, uh, the properties under certain acreage, the wording, the size of the letters, the spacing of the signs. It, it's all defined in that, stat, that Florida State statute, which is 810.0. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll put in the trespassing statutes. They're also in 810, um, but generally the offense is, I think, 810.08 and 09. Let me see here. And so if you pull up the Florida state statutes and look those up, it has some of the definitions about what constitutes trespassing and excuse me, that covers uh, trespassing in like, you know, I think, I think 08 is uh, trespassing in a structure conveyance, whatever. And I think 09 is trespassing in other than uh, a, you know, other than a conveyance or, or structure. So that would be open land, a dock, a uh, dock, you know, a, a, a business parking lot, something like that. So um, feel free to read those over and, and we're, we're always happy to help out with that stuff. So if you need help interpreting, if anybody has any questions, please email us or, or call us and we'll, we'll help walk you through it. Awesome. Any, any questions for the team on trespassing before we move on? Going once, going twice. Um, Hey, Swin, it's David yes. again. 
Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, the officer had mentioned uh, meeting with homeowners maybe to look at their signage and making sure the property is properly signed. Would, would that, how do we make that available or how do just, we contact you? Yeah, just shoot me an email and say you'd like to arrange a time for us to meet you. We'll, we'd be glad to do a site visit with with people up there and uh, just kind of help to make sure that you're uh, I mean you know I'd like it I'd, I'd like everybody to be a little bit uh discretionary I mean if you've never had a problem with trespassing then you know we're happy to come up anyway uh, but if you have had regular and recurring things and you know let's try to prioritize uh those homeowners and business owners first and uh that might help to solve the problem in a, a more rapid way uh but again we're making the offer for everybody of course but Terrific. Um, if you've been Thank having you. consistent problems, get with us. Terrific. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, and then real quick, uh, it's a question. Uh, it's going back to something we already dis discussed earlier. Is the beach considered open land? So just quickly, I'll, I'll recap what Mike said earlier. And it's it's uh, it's in our town hall video from two years ago. A lot of detail. Uh, the the uh, submerged uh, land in Florida is owned by the state, right? Sovereign land, and it's for the public enjoyment. So the public has uh, ability to to anchor on the beach, and you know the the terminology is to the mean high tide line. That gets super complicated because it's it's uh, it's done in this seventeen year measurement you know, of what, what this, you know, I, I can't remember the term it's tide and storm uh, cycle. And there's yeah, a lot of it's this whole for, cycle. for our purposes. We just say, okay, the Sandy portion of the beach is, is generally open for public thoroughfare. Yeah. Um, you know, there might be some exemptions to that. If there's an area that's just like hundreds of yards wide um, then, you know, we, we would look for like a rack line, but you know, if we can see kind of any established rack line, that's anywhere seaward of that is going to be good to go. But generally, even like the sandy portion, one of the reasons that, that differentiates that green line from the sand, I mean, there's a reason those plants don't grow there, and it's because that's within that, that area of storm and tide cycle for the most part. Um, you know, I mean, if it, so, I mean, it's one of those things, again, we want to exercise a, a certain degree of discretion. You know, I mean, if you've got people out there just enjoying the beach, they're not harming anybody, then just don't really worry about it. I mean, if you have people coming up and tromping around in the dunes and coming up to your house and peeking in windows, that's obviously a different level of, of disturbance to the homeowner and, and a, a larger breach of, of their personal security, space and security. So, you know, that would be more of the guideline we'd look for, you know, I mean, um, so with the house on a beach, I'm not sure about the specifics of that question, but yeah, I, did... so I, I I think this is really getting to, uh, I think that question is more of a, a, a community development zoning uh, thing where, you know, their uh, house is destroyed after the, the hurricane. It's one of the ones that's, you know, you right. consider it's on the beach, like it's right. Yeah, I mean, they can walk under, they can walk under, they can be along that edge, but I mean, they wouldn't be able to enter the structure um that would be my my assessment of it if there's a particular case or a particular house we need to look at get with me because we we'd probably have to go and look and see what the actual um circumstance is but you know we did have that up kind of close to the runway a while ago there was a house where the the you know there's a natural erosion and accretion of of beach there and sometimes that works in your favor where sand is deposited out in front of your house and you have hundreds of yards of beautiful beach in front of you. And sometimes uh, tragically it works against you and that encroaches into, you know, into or under the structure. Sometimes it undermines it and destroys the structure. Um, but, you know, that's the nature of, uh, of, of coastal beaches. Um, and it's why Captiva put so much money into beach renourishment to stabilize and maintain that shoreline. Um, you guys do not do beach renourishment, so you're kind of up to the, the natural cycles of erosion and accretion up there, so. Yeah, so the, the house you're talking about is probably big on the beach there at Sea Air, where some, sometimes you're just forced, you, you, you have to walk under it. There's yeah, absolutely. No way yeah. not to yep. get by without walking under right. it. Okay, uh, so hey, Mike, let's, um, uh, let's jump to dumping. 
Okay. That's, that, that, that's a, that's a hot topic and it's look, it's going to get bad. History uh, tells us and history repeats that once these debris teams leave the Island, there's still tons of work that's going to happen over the next year and, and further uh, dumping uh, on the Island has been a big problem in the past. And it's going to be a big problem over the next year or so. Um, the hardest thing, obviously, is identifying who who, who dumped this here, right? Right. Um, so, what can you just walk us through? You know, what are the laws on dumping? If if we're able to, maybe through a camera registry, catch someone. Yes. <laughs> actually, dumping. Uh, what can be done? So, I was going to say that this is one of those cases where a camera would be of immense value. I mean, if you have footage of the person actually dumping, uh, that's helpful. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually set Chris to a little bit of an errand here real quick. If you can pull up the dumping statutes, that would be helpful. So there's, so for regular dumping for a private citizen, there's different weights that constitute different punishments for dumping. Um, but for commercial purposes, so if you have somebody who's being paid to do landscaping, trash removal, whatever, if they are dumping any quantity of material, it's a felony if it's a, if it's for commercial purposes. Um, and in our discussions, you know, this was kind of a hot topic about a year and change ago with a lot of landscape material that was being dumped in the vacant lots. I think it came about because of a, a, a series of letters that code enforcement put out about maintaining uh, illegal brush piles and stuff on land. So if somebody dumps without permission, onto a property for a commercial purpose, any quantity, it's a felony. The Even with permission, they cannot dump material. Like I, I can't say, even if like, uh, okay, my neighbor says, hey, you can go ahead and dump all of your yard waste in the middle of my yard. I don't live there. I don't care. I have an empty lot. Just dump it there. They actually still can't do that because there is county ordinances against uh, maintaining brush piles on residential land. So, you know, in the state statute, it says dumping without permission, but then it also has language about or where otherwise forbidden by law, rule, you know, whatever. So that, that would not be legal in any case because there's a county ordinance about maintaining brush on a residential uh, property. So unless it's zoned for the storage of, of of brush, you know, like the dump or something, uh, unless it's properly zoned, you can't maintain that on there. So the only ways for people to dispose of debris, um, you know, so like for plant debris, you know, brush, that's always a problem for North Captiva. Your options are to shred it and spread it. So it's got to be shredded all the way down and spread out across. It can't be maintained in a big giant pile. It's got to be spread across the property. The other option is to um, load it up and take it to the county dump. And that's, that's I mean, unless somebody is more imaginative than me uh, and the code enforcement officer that was out here at the time, uh, he explained to me that's pretty much your options on getting rid of that. And it would be the same thing with household debris and, and garbage. You know, I mean, you can, if you dump it on a vacant lot, you know, you're in violation. So... And then do you, uh, I know that Chris just put the the ordinance in the in the chat, but Chris, have you got the weights do, there? Do you know what the violation is? Yeah, give me just a second. I gotta learn how to read. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys are all from the north. I went to school down here. So don't blame me. <laughs> yeah, there's penalties are all at the bottom. Yeah, I'm I'm getting to them. Yeah. Uh, so any person who dumps litter in violation of subsection four in the amount of excessing 15 pounds in weight or 27 cubic feet in volume and not for commercial purposes commits a non-criminal infraction punishable by a civil penalty of $150. Uh, any person, let's see, for commercial purposes, it's the same measurements, 15 pounds or 27 cubic feet in volume, but not in excess of 500 pounds in weight or 100 cubic feet in volume uh, for commercial purposes commits a misdemeanor, the second degree. Hmm. And 500 pounds turns it into a felony. 
I'm going to look into that because I just pulled up that statute here a little while ago and it was for it was any quantity was listed as a felony. But let's revisit that. Uh, in any case, you let's let's leave it at that you can't dump onto other people's property uh, and you can't illegally maintain uh, brush or debris on a residential property. And, and we'll let the courts worry about how to punish you. Yeah, it gets it gets pretty egregious, you know, on the island, right? We're so unique to like Captiva and, and, and other areas, right? We don't have uh, public waste, right? So to, to remove debris like that from the islands, you know, the going rate's eight hundred to nine hundred dollars a bull bag, right? right to, to get it off the island. So what happens is these, you know, some people, maybe some homeowners, they're contractors. They go, well you know, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to dump it over here. It doesn't get noticed. No one who knows who did it. And now it becomes that homeowner's $800 problem and, right. and potential code enforcement problem. Yes. So, yeah. And that, that's what we ran into with the, uh, with, with those letters that went out from code enforcement uh, last time was that a lot of homeowners who don't live down here and have not visited the vacant lot that they purchased on Upper Captiva back in 1973 are suddenly getting, you know, uh, letters from code enforcement saying that they're in violation and they need to remediate the problem like right away. And, you know, we're getting calls from saying, hey, what, what's going on on my property? Why am I getting fined? You know, blah, blah, blah. And that, you know, so we had a little spate of those. Um, and it is illegal and it's also just very unneighborly. To do that because you know i know in the past there was kind of you know everyone thought well there's no consequence to this i'll throw it over in this lot and nobody's ever going to know until they build a house there but now you know those people that own that and those people that are your neighbors and uh whatever they they are receiving fines they are receiving letters so uh i think that's a, a practice that especially as the island starts to reach closer and closer to full build out um is a practice that really needs to cease um, not just for the sake of your neighbor and their pocketbook, but um, it, it's dangerous to have these lots that are just full of, you know, for, for lack of a better descriptor, a giant funeral, Viking funeral pyre yeah. out there that takes up, you know, a, a, a quarter acre. It's just very dangerous for surrounding homes. Um, you know, my experience with uh, residential house fires and structure fires on North Captiva is that generally when that happens, it'll consume one house and generally consume either another or create uh, substantial damage to surrounding houses. So I think maintaining lots that have all of this debris is a a, a real danger to you guys as a community. And, and it's something that I think everybody roundly should just agree is, is a, a practice that needs to end. Yeah, it's uh, it's just so tough, right? Because you know, we just don't see it. We don't know who's doing it. But it's, I'm, I promise everyone, it's 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 going to get bad over the next six to twelve months. You're going to see a lot of dumping. And well, I think getting gonna, getting the debris gone um, is is going to be helpful, of course. Um, but that might just be something to look into. Also, making sure that your contractors and your you know landscape companies and stuff up there have suitable means to dispose of uh of this waste material you know they can shred it and spread it in place uh if there is a homeowner i, I know i said you can't give permission to, to put a big debris pile but you can certainly have them come over and shred it and then rake it out across your your vacant lot if you want or across your garden um you know so if you don't want to pay for the removal, you might just have to get creative about uh, that shredding process. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's something, you know, it's something that you have to look into probably through uh, DP, DNR, whatever, about whether or not it can be incinerated in some way up on the island. Maybe there's a disposal measure, but that's we've, something we've, I can't we've, speak we've, on. We've been through it with, with the county. Yeah, we, yeah we it's something even, I can't speak on. Yeah, we can't even have a, um, a, a vegetative dump on the island it's considered light industrial and a zoning that will never happen on a right. bear. so in that statute if you guys look down at subsection c if whenever we're done with this meeting if people want to review it that's when it starts going to the commercial section and um, the different levels of felony based on weights but yeah any commercial dumping is a violation of the forest state statute 
Yeah. And, and for everyone, we'll, we're going to take uh, UCCA, we're going to create some pages on these topics. We'll put these, um, these ordinances and, and the violation info in, in those um, blog posts and everything. So you can easily get to them. Uh, so uh, any questions um, from anyone on about dumping for Mike and Chris? All right. I think, I think we're just going to have to be diligent, uh, keep our eyes out. There are a lot more cameras on the island. So just, you know, trying to catch things happening on, on camera. And you guys have a limited number of people that do you know, contract maintenance and, and uh, uh, landscaping and things like that. So I think it's important to make sure even at the customer end, just making sure you know what they're doing with it, especially because they're probably charging you to dispose of it. Um, and if they're not disposing of it correctly, um, not only is it possibly dumping, but they might be committing a fraud by, you know, charging people for work they're not doing. Um, so I think it's important to get in contact with those uh, people and just make sure that your expectation about what happens to this debris is met. Um, and uh, just collectively, if you guys are having problems with a particular company or something, then, you know, we'll, let's work together and we'll make sure we keep them on the road of the righteous. Cool. Uh, prevention, right? We had, we had um, over the last few months, we've had people, you know, talking about theft and, and stuff like that. We have incidences where golf carts get, you know, borrowed um, and, and other things. Do you want to kind of go through some of those prevention points? It all comes back to golf carts. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the golf carts, Always you know, we, we discussed a, a couple of good methods for controlling some of this. I mean, that does seem to be when we do have theft calls. I mean, just throughout the history of, of my time on North Captiva, I would say the most commonly stolen item is golf carts. Um, some of the time it comes down to the fact that the person doesn't understand that, uh, you know, hey, this one is from a North Captiva Island. It's got an NCIC sticker, or a Safety Harbor Club sticker, and that's who I rented my house from. So I'll just take this one, you know, or all the carts look the same and they hop on one instead of the other or they theirs breaks down and they walk into the yard of the business and take theirs. And all of those things can really be uh, uh, stopped, disrupted by locking the golf carts. And uh, there are some commercial products out there that are kind of like the old fashioned uh, club for your car. Um, if anybody else watched a lot of late night TV in the 1990s, you're well familiar with what I'm talking about. But even something simple like a bike lock that runs through the steering wheel and then through the roof support, um, that'll keep people from general, generally keep people from taking those carts, especially if they plan on making any turns. Um, the other things that we've seen that work really well, uh, Yusepa Island has uh, a, a system on all their carts. It's like a little keypad. It's a code and the cart won't start unless you punch in that keypad, uh, punch in that code. It works great. Um, we've been out there and borrowed their carts a few times. And not only does it prevent theft, it prevents the whoops, I got on the wrong cart problem, which when we trace a lot of these down, I would say a high percentage of them come out to be a, a good faith mistake or at least a somewhat explainable reason why they did what they did other than I am a golf cart thief. Um, so, you know, simple things like that, whether it's a golf cart or whether it is um, oh, the other thing about the golf carts real quick is uh, you can put tracking in them pretty easily. I mean, right now, an, an Apple AirTag is what, like 30 bucks, yeah. you know, you can go ahead and hide that somewhere in your cart. And, um, you know, that'll let you know where your cart is pretty much all the time. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that's a, a low cost, you know, pretty, pretty high tech solution to some of those problems. But, you know, prevention, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, you know, if you lock it up, you're just not going to have the problem in the first place. And that goes for other materials, uh, you know, other items, property materials in and around your house. You know, I think a lot of us um, who, who live on these islands, you know, they're low crime areas and we sometimes get lax about personal security and, and property security around our houses because, you know, it, things just don't happen that often. So we leave things out in the yard. We don't lock the door. We leave, you know, stuff out. So 
if you remove the things from public view, if you take the time to lock the door, what you keep from happening is that crime of opportunity. I mean, somebody coming by and they see that low hanging fruit and just decide, oh, you know what? I, I do need a new golf cart charger. Mine just broke. And they go scuttling up your driveway and snatch it and, and take off with it. So by having that in, in the shed, even if it's just out of view, it, it's already eliminated that uh, that problem, the likelihood of that theft. Um, and if it's locked up, all the better. Um, if you have items of value, um, I would also encourage you to uh, take note of serial numbers, um, put on owner applied numbers um, or marks that are unique to that item. Um, we run into this a lot with like bicycle thefts. Somebody will give us like a make and model of a bike. They go, oh, my bike was stolen. It's a, you know, it's a, a Trek 8100. Okay. Uh, you ride around and all of a sudden you're finding 10 Trek 8100s. Or even if you find the one you think is that one, if they don't have the serial number, if there is no way to identify that that's theirs, we're kind of out of luck uh, at, at that point. Um, so do take note of those things. You know, I, I keep a spreadsheet and a hard copy of serial numbers for things that I own, tools, appliances, um, you know, what have you. If it's got a serial number, I keep it, I keep a record of it. Uh, I would encourage people to do the same thing. Um, so it's just basic crime prevention things that you would do in your neighborhoods at home are things that you really should be doing on North Captiva as well. You know, particularly as the frequency of renting increases, um, you know, the more visitors, more guests on the island, uh, more workers on the island, more, I mean, basically uh, just people that you don't know. They're not your regular friends and neighbors. Um, you just want to be aware of the fact that uh, you want to prevent those, uh, those easy crimes, those crimes of opportunity. Yeah, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll just sort of weigh in on the golf cart thing. The, that uh, that keypad tracker, the the lead one out there is called Key QI, and we use them on our carts, and we don't have problems with our carts being taken. I I, I don't want to assume that everyone knows, but I think most people know that you know the club car key is a generic key. Like there, every club car can be used with that key, and you can usually just put a screwdriver in it and. And take yeah, off. especially the older, I mean, the, the older that ignition is, I mean, you, I mean, a lot of them you can start with, with anything. I mean, you pick a piece of shell or piece of mulch and turn that key. Some of them, the, the ignition is bad enough on them that you can just hop on it and go, whether their key is in it or not. Right. Um, you know, sometimes people bypass it out of convenience. I mean, I would just say how, you know, how inconvenient is it to punch in a, you know, four or six digit code? It takes, you know, two seconds and there's a, a lot of peace of mind or how hard is it to unlock that that uh, cart? And, um, you know, if you rent out your carts, I would consider putting into your rental agreement with the cart that they're required to lock it up when the cart is not attended. That is one of the things that our rental companies down here on, excuse me, on Captiva do. And they basically say we're not in any way you are wholly responsible if that cart gets stolen and it wasn't locked up. Um, and so just something to consider of putting the onus on the renter as well, of just saying, you know, if we're, we're going to kind of throw the screws to you if you don't take the common sense precautions to protect our, our investment and our property while it's entrusted to you. Any, uh, any questions for Mike on prevention? Any, any of that stuff? So, uh, Mike, let's go, let's jump into boaters, right? So we already talked about boaters landing on, on the beach and everything, but, you know, Chris, you know, called me last week and, and left a message. There's more and more calls coming in about the, the safety of boating, I think, within uh, Safety Harbor itself and in and yep. around the islands. You want to talk about that some? So uh, I'm sure most of you have noticed in your coming and going comings and goings that the uh, signage has changed out there along the approach to Safety Harbor, and it is now a slow speed zone rather than an idle speed zone. Um, and arguably, there's a small section there that's unregulated uh, going around that corner because there is no there, there's a gap in the signage that says uh, maintain regular safe operation and where you hit that next sign. Now, I, I wouldn't encourage anybody to do that. I think the spirit of that signage is that it's slow speed all the way out. Um, uh, but uh, that might be 
contributing to some of the things people are seeing is that people are passing that row of signs that say continue or resume safe operation and they start getting up on plane and then they're like oh wait a minute there's another you know another sign there um those signs are uh i'm, I'm not sure do you do you guys have to place those signs or does dnr place those i think dnr places okay. them. Yeah. There, there's some signs out there that are the responsibility of uh, of specific marinas and whatever. I mean, I know going to Pineland, they're responsible for their own signage. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we have no set marina like that. It's all. So, you know, yeah. So, so DNR places those signs. They have to do, you know, they, ha they have to establish these control, speed control zones, um, and they have to sign them. Now, years ago, there were uh, a, a series of county ordinances that regulated operation of vessels and uh, anchoring and docking and, and a number of other things. The, there's case law where it was determined the state of Florida says that the counties don't have the authority to regulate state waters in that way. Um, so they eliminated all of the uh, county created speed zones and replace that with a set of state criteria. Since then, my understanding is that the counties can create these zones, but they have to meet the criteria that the state sets. So no longer can we just say as Lee County, we wanna make this that speed, we want that that speed. It has to conform to these state standards. Um, you know, Roosevelt Channel here along Captiva is a good example. That was, you know, year round, edge to edge, from uh, Buck Key to Captiva was uh, either slow or idle speed down the entirety of that. Um, they changed that around after that, and there was no speed regulation except for around the gas pumps at uh, Tween Waters and at Jensen's. And then there's areas where the, the sight lines were bad. You know, the, the width of the channel was narrow enough, coupled with blind curves, and they said, okay, this meets requirements for a uh, year round slow speed zone. So the reason I bring that up is that they were able to articulate the need to make it slow speed again. But again, they had to use conforming standards. So I would say that if there's a problem with your zones or a problem with the signage, get with DNR and, you know, express your concern. That's the Department of Natural Resources, Lee County Department of Natural Resources, um, and see what can be done. I mean, it's a bit of a process because they have to, you know, it has to be submitted to the state has to be reviewed, it has to be approved. There's like a whole process. It's not as simple as just, yeah, that sounds good, go ahead and do it. Um, but if you do have concerns about the way it's signed or the way those zones are, I, I would encourage you to, to bring that to their attention. Um, now, uh, so yeah, within there, I mean, it's it's slow speed in the-, uh, in the yeah. uh, so, so real department. quick, Mike, just to clarify, are you saying when you go around, it says slow speed, and then it says resume, and then it says slow speed again? Well, when you're going out, when there's going out. a spot. There's a spot where if people are going out, they may see that resume normal safe operation, and start getting up on it. And then as they come up to like the point house, then they're like, oh wait, there's a a, a slow speed sign there again. Gotcha. Um, so I, I don't know what, I don't know if there is, I don't know if that's a problem everybody's observed or not. Uh, it's just something I noticed going by there the other day, just going, oh, well, you know, somebody arguably could see that and make a mistake. But I don't and know then, if that's been the experience of anybody in here. Yeah, so I don't, any, anyone on the call um, have feedback on what you're seeing in Safety Harbor? And David, you you um, said you wanted to, You'd asked if we were going to talk about this. There, are you still on? Hold on. Yes, I'm still on. You know, I, I have a great vantage point. I got to tell you, most of the time, most people are observing pretty safe speeds uh, coming around the around the point. Every once in a while, you'll see guys leaving the island, picking up speed along uh, the point house uh, direction out, uh, but. Quite frankly, the, most of them are smaller boats that don't leave much of a wake anyway. But um, honestly, most most speeds are pretty reasonable. What I'm watching, I, I did observe the change in your uh, in the signs when I came in on my boat. 
But, um, you know, I think my concern was somewhat different about the boaters and had more to do with the intoxicated boaters that we have the pleasure of seeing leaving at the end of the day. Uh, right. and that's been addressed. So my, my concerns have been addressed. Right. And, and David, to your, to your point, and that is something worth noting is that, um, slow speed, you know, and idle speed for those of you that aren't boaters, um, it, it's not actually a set speed. It's not five to 10 miles an hour or whatever. It's, um, you know, idle speed is fully the boat, the attitude of the boat would be fully settled in the water, pushing no wake. And, and basically the minimum speed required to maintain steerage and headway. Um, so, you know, if they're in strong winds or fighting a current, obviously that would be increased. Um, you know, slow speed is boat settled in the water, pushing minimal wake. The design of your boat makes a big difference in what that actual, like, you know, miles per hour or, or not, how that equates. Because there's plenty of these boats that are nice and long and thin and sleek that can be moving on at a, at a pretty good little clip, but they're still in compliance because that boat's fully settled in the water and they're pushing a minimum wake. Um, so it's it's like eyeballing it and going, man, that boat looks like it's going pretty fast. It doesn't mean they're necessarily in violation. Uh, the violation would come from them being on plane or plowing or whatever, so. Gotcha. Any other questions about uh boating or boaters? Yeah, I've got one, if you don't mind. Yes, yes. It's Frank Galliano. I'm on the uh, south end of the island. We uh, recently had our, a couple years ago, had our slow speed zone taken away from our docks. What is the, uh, but yet there's still massive areas with no docks, but it's quarter mile speed zone from the shoreline. What's the consistency or, or how is that justified? Is there any justification for the quarter mile from shoreline, but we're not included in that? Yeah, um, it's it's not, I'm not part of the decision-making process on that, so I couldn't really get into how they arrive at that. Um, but as I said, there there is a, a set of criteria that have to be met um, to to create these zones. I would encourage you to get with, I mean, if you have a concern about the way that that is down there or you're noticing damage or disruption or something, bring it to the attention of Lee County DNR and see if they can, you know, either review it um, through maps, through site visit, whatever it is. But, you know, uh, it, it is a, a county. We have just a huge amount of water here and we have a lot of waterways and it it's a, a difficult task. I'll say on their behalf, it, it's a very hard working group of people over there. They're great. Uh, they're very good to work with. Um, but it, it is hard to know where every problem area is. So if you live in a place where you see a, a problem or you're seeing a recurring issue, I, I'd encourage you to bring it to their attention. And uh, it, it might just be something that's been overlooked in, especially when they had to rescind all these county zones, uh, everything defaulted to kind of open and uh, so if it didn't meet their review criteria initially, then, you know, those signs had to be removed if they were created by those by those uh, nullified ordinances. So I, I'd say get with them and have them review it. That's basically what they did in Roosevelt Channel on Captiva. Uh, a lot of the people said they're seeing problems and um, approached the county and said, we would like you to advocate for this speed zone. And, and they did. And it was successful. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You got it. Anything else on uh, boats or boaters, boat traffic before we move on? All right. Uh, hey, Mike, since we're, we're rounded two hours, um, so I, uh, I'm gonna, let's get drones. Uh, that's well documented in yeah. our last one. Uh, so if, if anyone wants to review the town hall we did um, with Mike and Chris, Two years ago, you can go to Upper Captiva Civic Association.org, uh, go to go to members, and, and I think it says or pages it says town halls, and you can scroll in there and, and find the video. And there's a, there's a little table of contents, and go to whatever topic you want pretty quickly and, and find that. Yes. Yeah. And, and as a one sentence explanation, it's regulated by the FAA, not us. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
so uh, can we talk about uh, dark skies and and you know lighting in turtle season and and stuff? Yeah, like that? and I'll make that real short because it's mostly a code enforcement thing. Um, yeah. You know, we're we're happy to assist code enforcement. But when it comes to lighting, because of you know requirements for specific wavelengths and you know lighting types, it requires instruments and you know they have filters and they have photo spectrometers and they have all manner of things to document and, and articulate these violations that that we don't have. Um, so generally, it would be code enforcement for at the user end for you guys. The the best first step I would say is um, there is an ordinance that requires all visible light. Um, within any of the brighter spectrum. So, I mean, there's amber lights and whatever that, and, and red lights that are within compliance. But generally, if a light is visible from the beach during um, the, the ordinance turtle season, which is May the 1st through October 31st, then it's a violation. And it's because the turtles see the lights, they navigate by, by moonlight, starlight, whatever. And uh, so they can become disoriented, becomes especially risky with baby turtles because they're only born with a, uh, certain amount of energy to get them out into the water and to start feeding. Um, and if they take a detour back up onto the dunes and out into the beach, they've cooked off a significant amount of that energy and it decreases their chances of survival immeasurably. Even worse if they get caught out in the middle of the uh, middle of the sun in the you know middle of the day. So um, that's really the importance of those the lighting compliance. Um, we've had good luck with um, putting decals and window clings onto some of the rental homes down here. Um, they have the after nine is turtle time or turtles dig in the dark or what turtles dig the dark. There's a few different ones, but the advantage is that if somebody again is visiting from out of state, um, they would know to uh, to shut off those lights, to close the blinds, to, you know, you know, and if you if you're walking out there as a homeowner, um, walk out to the beach at night, turn around, look at your house um, and take a walk a little bit up and a little bit down, because we found a lot of homeowners walk straight out, turn around and look and go, oh, I'm in compliance. Great. But if you walk 50 yards down the beach, you can see all their lights from their front yard. And that has been exacerbated this year because of the loss of uh, foliage and vegetation. There's a lot of houses that in previous years, you would never have thought, I mean, you, they live two blocks off the beach and now there's a, a light that's shining straight out onto there, creating a problem. So, you know, if you live out on the beach or close to the beach, take a minute to just uh, treat yourself to a nice moonlight walk. And while you're there, take a look at your lighting situation. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's similar. I've read the dark skies ordinance, but it's been a while. Um, I, I would refer you to code enforcement for questions about that one. Yeah, I think mostly we're we're trying to attack it from the UCCA standpoint of the community standard. Melissa, who's who's on here, is all right. Um, Melissa, <laughs> yeah, le leading the way a lot on on that, and you know I think it's uh, the biggest thing. It's an educational thing, right? I yeah, think and, and most people probably don't really realize that we have the ordinance and, and what it's about and and everything. And just like we talked about with the golf carts, you know, having a decal or, or some kind of signage about docks or whatever, it helps the people that, that aren't trying to cause a problem to act the right way. And um, it's hard because, you know, I think a lot of us lean, you know, in the in the in the property management business, especially, you know, our, our, our partners in that industry, you know, they put all this information in a binder that's sitting on the countertop when people check in. And uh, I, I know from experience of renting a house that uh, the first thing I did was not sit down at the table and leaf through that binder full of information. Uh, I think most people grab a beer and walk out on the deck and look at the uh, at the at the beach. And unless the coffee table starts wobbling, they don't interact with that binder at all, uh, unless they need it to keep it from from jiggling. So that's the advantage of having something like the turtle time sticker or a golf cart thing is it, it puts it right in front of the person as they're using the cart or as they're going in and out of the door. So it, it reinforces it in an easily digestible message and gains the kind of uh, behavioral compliance that you guys are looking for. Awesome. Any questions about night skies, dark skies and lighting before we move on? All right. So uh, next is is hurricane preparedness. We wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, 
real quick, we'll we'll probably do a full UCCA uh, Zoom within the next month, um, specifically on hurricane preparedness, and might probably invite you back and and Perfect. hopefully have our acting fire chief, uh, you know, join us and kind of talk about it because you know here we go. In, in that case, what I'll do is starts in, in two weeks, two and a half weeks. I'll, I'll make a quick pitch and um, then let everybody go to bed. <laughs> uh, but one thing that has worked very well for us uh, down, down here is creating a community-based hurricane preparedness committee. Um, I know, uh, Swin, that I'd sent you some information about the storm ready yep. designation for community, and that would be a good thing to look into. But the things that are important about it is that um, at Hurricane Committee, we used it extensively to encourage public education and to make our residents down here storm wise. And one of the things that we found, not just with North Captiva, other places around the county, is there was a real gap in knowledge uh, and preparedness. And I think it came from, um, you know, a lot of people that have just recently moved down here. They really aren't aware of kind of what occurs in preparation for Hurricane. Um, they were waiting for an evacuation order to come. And, you know, part of that is understanding that those evacuation orders are a legal designation and there's things that have to happen before they can do it. It, it, it coincides with the opening of shelters um, and there's a lot of decision making that goes into it. Um, they don't want to raise false alarms because then people won't evacuate. We had a lot of people say, well, I evacuated for Irma, so I wasn't going to evacuate for Ian. And that's the danger of, of putting out an evacuation order too early um, because all of us, Chris, Christine, me, and everybody in the, in the meeting, we all uh, live in, work in, or own property in a highly storm prone area. You know, it's incumbent upon us to be knowledgeable about storms and to have all of our preparations in order well ahead of time. I mean, if you're waiting for that evacuation order to come up with a plan, you've already waited too long. And, um, you know, when that evacuation order comes, you should be ready to turn the key on your boat and go, uh, or you should be there ready to turn the ignition in your car and start driving uh, out of that zone and to a shelter. My advice would be for people to make a plan that does not involve the public shelters. Um, the public shelters are, are as well done as we possibly can make them but it's still a, a not an ideal experience for people. I mean, it's a big crowded area with little privacy and, you know, a lot of noise, a lot. Of, I mean, it's, 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 it can be a difficult environment for people. Um, so I would encourage you and I'll, I'll share my own plan, which is when we have a large storm entering the Gulf or where we are likely to be uh, affected, I send my family out of state. Uh, we, they head up somewhere towards like Atlanta, Georgia. That's pretty much like as far as they can, go during a, uh, a one day drive and they sit there until we have friends up there. They sit until the storm passes. If it's not that bad, they turn around and drive back. If it's that, if it is, uh, they continue to bounce around to uh, kindly friends and well-wishers until, uh, until things are ready for them to return. But, you know, that's important because the longer you wait, uh, the harder it is to enact a plan. The more people you're in competition with other people, for fuel, there's more traffic, there's people's patience gets shorter. The, the earlier you make and enact your plan, the more control you have over how it plays out. So I would just encourage everybody to have that, that ready. And, um, and I know there's gonna be people that'll argue with this point, but there's really no purpose in staying on uh, any of these barrier islands um, when a major storm is approaching. Um, there is just simply the, the only outcomes you can affect are the things that you do in preparation. Once a storm is here and there's 20 feet of storm surge, there is no human effort that's going to impact the outcome. So the best thing you can do is, is prepare your home, prepare your property, uh, have a, a plan in place and enact that plan early because, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, we had a significant loss of life in Lee County um, for people that that stayed in uh, uh, dangerous hurricane prone areas. And I really wouldn't want that to be any of you up there. I mean, we all got very fortunate with uh, the the eye of the storm passing over out here. 
um, the orientation of the island helped out quite a bit. And the fact that a, a good portion of the effect broke over the east end of Sanibel, leaving us in the lee side of some of that. So, uh, but, you know, if, if we'd had a different route of that storm, I mean, even a, a five minute difference in that in that impact, a couple more miles offshore, you know, I mean, you're talking about a massive storm that wind, wind and winds its way across from Africa, building up steam. Uh, the the margin of error for us in that is razor thin. And uh, it, it's not something you can wait until the very end to enact a plan. So again, this comes, I, I think having a preparedness committee up there, it allows for that public education. It allows people to understand what they're looking at in these forecasts. A lot of the jargon can be very dense. We had a lot of people that looked at these maps and said, well, I'm not going to evacuate because we're not in the cone. Well, you know, when you're looking at those things, that's not a cone of effect. It's the probable center line of the storm. And these are things that people on North Captiva, people on Captiva, and people on Sanibel that we encountered after the storm cited as reasons why they stayed is that they didn't think it was going to be that bad because they misunderstood the information that was coming to them. So that public ed education is critical. The other thing it does is it allows you guys as a community to have uh, like, you know, to liaise directly with public safety agencies that are going to be serving you in the wake of a hurricane. And I think that will help, you know, there was obviously problems with the uh, expectations and the execution of things uh, for North Captiva. And I think again, having a, a strong community public safety partnership in preparation would, would avoid a lot of that. Yeah, I think it's important too that, you know, to note that I'm sure you guys know even better than us, the landscape of the island has changed since Ian. And we just don't know how the island's going to perform the next time. So, I, I mean, I really think that preparation, this is something that my wife and I have talked about. We're going to have to prep a little harder this year than we did before because we just don't know how the island's going to perform. If something even smaller comes our way, we, we might need to be just a little more prepared than we have in the past, just because you don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and with the current damage to a lot of people's homes and, and structures and everything, um, a lot of us would be in trouble if we got hit with another major storm. So, uh, again, I mean, having having those plans and, um, you know, as they say, and I think this is a good closing, uh, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And uh, that that's, I think, the guiding principle that we should adopt out here and adopt a, a real culture of preparedness uh, because of where we live. Great, great info. Uh, so, sort of in in closing, does anyone have a topic that we didn't cover that that you want to cover that that you want to ask questions? See anything in the chat? People are starting to log off. I think, yeah, they've had I think enough. We're done. So, <laughs> so, Mike, Chris, Christine, can't thank you you three enough. Um, I'll just say to everyone, uh, they're available to you. Uh, they say call, you can call them. They'll call you back. They'll answer the phone. So um, th thanks again for, for doing this town hall. I think it's really great and informative for um, the community. And we're, we're gonna, we've recorded it. We're going to post it again on the UCCA website um, so people can revisit it. Perfect. Well, uh, as I just typed in, thank you all for the invite. We we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. And, you know, again, our, our whole community policing model relies on a strong relationship with you. Um, so please don't be shy about reaching out to us about problems or issues. And uh, we're, we're always here to help. We're here for you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Have all a right. great night. Good night. Okay.